and we are live. <laughs> Hi, John. Hello, Ivan. Good to see you, my friend. How are you? You look good. I'm, I'm good. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. Um, keeping very busy. Uh, obviously, um, times have changed. Uh, um, bands are not touring and performing. So um, I spend a lot of my time in the studio uh, anyway. So I'm maximizing um, that uh, producing, uh, you know, working on uh, my own material and um, new ministry, so many things. So yeah, uh, keeping very busy. Yeah, that's great. And I don't know, I'm sure a lot of people already know you, but I would like you just, if you can make a little introduction with yourself, people well, that don't know you. Sure. My, uh, my name is John Bechtel. Um, uh, I'm a keyboard player, uh, musician, guitarist, vocalist, uh, producer, composer, all kinds of things. Um, I'm uh, uh, U.S., uh, born and raised in Pennsylvania, and uh, uh, been a touring musician for over 30 years with uh, many bands, uh, most recently, of course, Ministry for the last 14 years, and before that, Fear Factory. Uh, prong, Killing Joke, Murder Inc. Um, so I've been uh, very active um, the last uh, uh, couple of decades. Uh, and also, um, uh, like I said, uh, uh, in the studio as well, uh, where I spend most of my time. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a really 30? It's, yeah, I, I started, started. Yeah, I started touring in 1987. So 33 years I've been a tour, professional touring musician. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's really impressive. <laughs> And yeah, we can, I don't know, we can so we, we can see your all your biography or uh, all, yes, the, I'm, all uh, the best. Working on that actually right now uh, with, with all this extra time, I just started a Reverb Nation page um, for John Bechtel, uh, which also is going to be including my new solo work. And then um, uh, uh, my Wikipedia page uh, is yeah. uh, uh, going to be updated very soon with some uh, new interviews and uh, a lot more information. Um, that uh, was not there before. And yeah, so I'm uh, spending a lot of time trying to take care of those, those things that normally I just don't have time to do. So it's yeah, really of course, mm -hmm. of course, uh, I, I'm sure many people ask you, ah, what you do this, what do you do that? I, you don't have the time, you know? Yeah, but th now I do. So um, yeah, so yeah. I'm, uh, <laughs> You know, uh, I don't want to jump ahead too much, but uh, you, as you know, because you've Vigilante has toured um, with my band False Icons, um, yes. uh, that that too um, is uh, uh, something that um, uh, uh, I've been working on too, trying to um, get get the social media updated um, for um, for False Icons, and and that also has includes some new bio information and uh, uh, photos and videos, so everything's. Um, Uh, getting updated right now and uh, is in the process and and uh, 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 I'm, yeah I, I don't want to jump ahead I know you're going to talk about a lot of things but yeah so uh, uh, <laughs> no but that's um, great because yeah. I I don't know if uh, most of people know you about ministry but not m maybe not many people know about your your project called false icons yes yeah yeah maybe um, you can talk a, a little bit about it sure how it started uh, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so um, I've been a musician my entire life. I started playing piano at five. I was lis listening to music and uh, very serious about music even before that um, and was probably six or seven when I knew that that's what I wanted to do uh, wow. with, my, with my life. So, yeah. That's um, really early. <laughs> uh, and then um, I uh, started learning guitar Um, as a teenager and um, uh, was uh, already kind of playing in in bands, um, mostly cover stuff, but also I was kind of, you know, beginning to write uh, my own material. And uh, uh, right before I went to college, I um, bought my first synthesizer. I was 17. I was into electronic music. It was very, uh, very new, the whole thing at that time. And uh, I also um 
because I knew uh, I, I, I knew what I wanted to do. I focused uh, my college career on that. I went to a very unique school um, in New England that allowed you to kind of do whatever you wanted. And um, I, I wanted to do electronic music, but I also was very interested in computers. And uh, that was something that was very new at the time as well. Uh, I tried getting into computer programming. I had some friends that did, did not really uh, did not really understand programming languages too much, and and the whole idea uh, of that. I was thinking about trying to you know design my own interfaces and um, wow. and you use computers uh, to control synthesizers. Something that really wasn't even you know happening yet, but uh, yeah. was just on the cusp of of happening and um, and. Uh, since uh, I wasn't a good programmer, uh, computer programmer, uh, I kept focusing on what I what I did feel I was natural at, which was um, electronic music uh, and um, and music production. And um, so I kind of kept kept my eye on the ball there. But I did study uh, physics and acoustics, uh, all aspects of, of sound, and and uh, and and then. Uh, um, was already by then uh, learning, um, you know how to you know do multi-track recordings and work on modular synthesizers and still oh. always uh, you know kind of have my my guitar um, and, and and would use that as well uh, and even was um, beginning to to you know to to do uh, uh, vocals. Uh, um, I sang in a band that I had in college. Uh, we did original music and so yeah, that was the early '80s. Um, so. Uh, yeah. so, uh, then, um, uh, after college, I moved to New York where, um, I started my career kind of doing a lot of different things, um, working in a music store and, um, and I got to meet a lot of people and some producers and, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, started programming and, um, also I was doing lectures and seminars on sampling and, and synthesizers and oh, just completely immersed uh, in, in it. And um, all, all the while um, building up my own uh, home studio, bought my first computer. And, um, you know, by then this technology was, you know, readily available and affordable or well, kind of affordable. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, yeah. and, uh, and I, I, you know, I was able to, uh, to, to start uh, literally, um, you know, doing everything, you know, uh, to c compose my own music. Um, and then uh, I got uh, uh, an opportunity um, uh, to, to play keyboards for Killing Joke. It was, you know, one of the most amazing things that really ever happened to me. That was your, me. kind of your first uh, big gig? Well, yeah, but that, you know, it wouldn't have happened if, if I wasn't playing in a band called Brian Brain um, with Martin Atkins. That, uh, as soon as Martin I moved Atkins? to... Yeah, sure. Um, okay. yeah, uh, when I moved to New York uh, in um, the spring of 1987, uh, I knew about him. A friend of mine was friends with him, but uh, I didn't know him. But uh, anyway, he was looking for a keyboard player, guitar player, and my friend recommended that you know me to him. Said I just moved to New York, so he called me up and offered me you know to to kind of try out for for this band, and um, and uh, we had a really good. Uh, uh you know rehearsal and he was like wow you know you know, you're definitely a very motivated person um uh, like your vibe and and uh and uh, we started playing shows in new york uh city uh like the limelight and the cat club and it's just very exciting um we and uh during uh, this time he was playing with ministry too no or? no this like, was this like was before. Uh, oh yeah this was right after he quit pill so, oh okay yeah so this was mid mid 80s and um all right and uh uh we uh my first tour was with brian brain um we traveled uh, to, uh you know um well about halfway across the country to, to minneapolis and back and uh you know one of the things that you know i talk about a little bit but a lot of people don't know uh um uh, we had some guest horn players uh, in the Midwest, in, in Ohio, uh, one, of, one of which was Trent Reznor. Yeah. What? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> on, the, on my very first tour, yeah. This was before Nine Inch Nails, before, um, you know, Martin joined Killing Joke or Ministry. Uh -huh. And 
So yeah, so uh, we put out a, an EP. That was my first time, you know, recording on a, an official release, and um, this was just all happening very quickly. Um, so yeah, like still, like I said, um, working um, in my own studio, um, mm. composing music and programming, and, and working with other people, uh, producers, and Martin and I as well worked outside of um, Brian Brain. Um, he was very impressed with uh you know samplers and and how i had you know electronic um drum pads and we could program rhythms into the computer and things that he yeah. didn't you just never didn't even know you could do and and uh we you know we, we um we uh we had a lot of fun doing that and then uh he uh had an opportunity uh to drum for killing joke and of course killing joke were like my all-time favorite band and i used to do nothing but play Killing Joke on that tour when we were tr driving across country. Uh, <laughs> all I played was Killing Joke tapes, and Martin was like, you know, "Who is this band that you keep playing?" And I was like, oh, "It's Killing Joke." So, uh, so it was just so <laughs> ironic, um, you know, to find out that he was drumming for them. And then, of course, it was only a matter of time until I kind of, you know, kind of, you know, told him, "Look, I'm, you know, if if you guys need a keyboard player, you know, I, I you know, I'm I'm just totally totally down with that." And he said um, that the, it, that might be a possibility, and it ultimately turned out that it was. They they asked me to to become their new touring mm -hmm. keyboard player. And for, for the people that don't don't actually know, I I don't know. Uh, do you think Killing Joke is uh, what, what for you is the influence uh, in the influence of Killing Joke? In, in music, because for me, his influence is so so big, and not not um, too many people know about uh, this band. Yeah, I keep it's saying the, this, the young the young uh, generation, and yeah. for me, it's very influential. Uh, you know, yeah. Ministry, uh, mm -hmm. I, many 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 other bands that were inspired by by Killing Joke. Yes, I mean I, I keep talking about that, about that about that very fact, and you just can't talk about it enough. But um, uh, it's just so amazing that you know, for me, I mean, uh, I know we're building up to the whole story about false icons, but you got to start, you know, from the beginning. So <laughs> yeah, anyway, uh, so uh, this was all happening early in my career. I was in my mid twenties, um, and uh, so uh, so yeah, so uh, when I was in high school, we're talking, you know, eighty eighty one. Um, uh, uh, we were from a very small, um, rural area in Pennsylvania at this time, you know, there was you know, just prior to, to say something like MTV, uh, um, we, uh, we were very isolated, um, um, nobody, you know, people weren't necessarily very, you know, uh, cultured in a sense of, you know, knowing much about, you know, the world open, and other places. Minded. Yeah, exactly. All that stuff. And, and, um, and, uh, and so we, of course, grew up on the same stuff everybody else did, you know, like Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, and then, you know, got into, you know, rock and roll and, 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 and some pop music, but, uh, but things started happening, you know, um, around that time period of, uh, 19, you know, 80, and 81 where suddenly we were finding all, all these uh bands that you know we'd never heard of before like there was one record store where we, we were near uh uh where penn state university uh was and that was about the most kind of you know uh uh culture kind of place we we, we could find to buy uh this new music and one record store was carrying it and um and so we just literally would just look at a record and say that looks cool and, and we buy it and we'd all listen to it and decide what we liked and you know um, pretty much liked everything but you know one of those bands of course was killing joke and and uh, and uh, it resonated even m more so than say anything else i mean we were listening to duran duran omd um human league uh you know craft work uh, king crimson i mean like uh, a wide mm -hmm. gang of four i mean just you know you name it but anyway when i heard uh that first Killing Joke record, and of course the second one, it, it was a life-changing experience. And um, I guess I still didn't realize, you know, how, I mean, well, I did. I mean, when we talked about these bands, people were like, who, what? You know, they had no idea what we were talking <laughs> about. They thought we were really weird. But then, you know, within a short period of time, they, they were all listening to a lot of these bands too. But not necessarily Killing Joke, because it was Killing Joke was just one of those bands that just, uh, as I described, it just couldn't seem to 
fit, uh, fit into any kind of some sort of category, um, which in the U.S. Uh, that's great. Seems, yeah, seemed to be the only way to market music. At least that's how business, uh, you know, music executives and business people would think was like, you know, well, what is this? And, you know, how do we how do we c categorize it? And where do we put it? And, and how do we market nah, it? It's still, just, it's still uh, the same. <laughs> yeah, K Killing Joke just couldn't, went, you know, they didn't really, they weren't new wave. They weren't yeah. punk, punk rock really per se. Um, uh, so yeah, they, they you know, um, they weren't really heavy metal, but they had the intensity um, of heavy metal. Yeah, so um, so yeah, so I, 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 I feel that that's why, they they never seem to get the, the notoriety that they deserved um, here in the U.S. But I do feel in Europe they they are yeah. more widely known and um, uh, but nonetheless uh, they inspired and influenced um, so many other bands hmm. to come. Um, but uh, you know, as you know, recently they supported Tool in the U.S. on a mega tour, arena tour, um, mm -hmm. and I thought that that was great for them that you know that, that they would finally get you know the kind of credit they deserve. But it seemed like even still, you know, people as progressive and and uh, uh, as as Tool fans just couldn't even really you know connect with this band. So uh, I don't get it. I just don't get it. I, I, I think you know. I mean, I've seen them uh, recently. Uh, as you know, it's the original four members, and um, they're as good, if not better, than ever. Jazz, you know, like I said uh, as well. Um, uh, top of his game, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and so, you know, Hey, it's better, you know, more for us. <laughs> uh, sure. People can't seem to get it, but even my daughter, uh, you know, um, uh, listens to killer joke. And, um, so I think, um, uh, a lot of people, um, you know, still, uh, you know, respect and, and admire this band, uh, just not particularly maybe on a, on a mainstream type of level, but, uh, nonetheless, uh, uh, they were one of the bands that that just somehow just really. I mean, when we when we would talk about them, people go, "Oh yeah, you know, like you know, Killing Joke." But most people did not really <laughs> know. But if you did know, you were a big fan. So, uh, so you know, with that in mind, you know, moving forward um, to this story about how you know Martin um, and, and ultimately myself, uh, um, uh, you know, we're, we're playing um, in the band. Yeah, of, what's your reaction when he he pro they propose you to? It's Thank a funny you. story. It's a funny story. Uh, I'll tell it. Um, you know, uh, what happened was um, they were rehearsing very near where I lived. And so I had never seen the band perform. I had never even, you know, like the idea of actually meeting them was beyond my wildest dreams. But here was this opportunity. Martin's like, yeah, hey, you know, why don't you just pop on over? Um, we're rehearsing, you know, not far. And uh, I hopped on my mountain bike and and rode, rode over and uh, 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 walked into this rehearsal space and um, and there they were. Uh, uh, I got to meet them and watch them rehearse. And, um, you know, uh, at the time they did have a, a touring keyboard player, but, uh, um, you know, Martin just kept saying, you know, hey, you know, you just never know. And um, I, I, I went to, you know, um, couple more rehearsals and then each time they played uh, in the New York uh, City area of course I was there and um, uh, you know made myself you know my, my presence known and, and and my admiration for the band and um, and uh, they got to you know know me a little bit more each time and uh, the story um, is that one night Martin called me it was a week night a work night and said they were playing at CBGB's and I was like you know, uh, you know, thinking about maybe taking a pass on this one, but um, decided, you know, I was gonna, I was gonna go for it, and I did, and and um, and uh, you know, um, had, had a really good time. But what was interesting was uh, by then, I was, you know, um, uh, jazz, you know, would sometimes, you know, stop the show to to have these like, you know, monologues about how you know he could, uh, he, he could smell hairspray like you know because all these punk rockers with their mohawk and he's like you know i smell hairspray and like you're destroying the ozone and it's like you know what you know like uh um i don't think we're still using you know uh you know fluorocarbons or whatever in in hairspray but whatever you know it's like and then he would say oh you know stop the show again and be like you know drum machines and samplers are destroying
destroying music. And I'm like, what? You know, like, what are you talking about? Like, um, and, uh, and, and I started to think like, as a fan, I just thought like, you know, I felt like he was kind of alienating, you know, the, the, the true fans that were there to, to see yeah. him. So, um, as much as I, you know, really admired the band, I, I did feel like, you know, something, you know, that, he didn't that give just up. wasn't right about that. So, um, after the show, Martin invited me to uh, a party, um, uh, like an after show party. And uh, I was like, well, what the heck, you know, it's like, it's going to be a late night. So uh, I, I went with them. We all hopped in a cab. And, and when we got out, it was like, you know, people were kind of, this place was packed and people were outside and they like immediately recognized the band and we're like, oh, wow, you know, and then I was with them. So I kind of, it was almost like, you know, I was getting this kind of royal treatment and feeling like, wow, uh, this is what it's like to, to you know to to, to yeah. be uh, in a band and, and and be on tour is really exciting and uh, we went in and you know like I said it was packed and uh, they they got us a booth and um, and uh, Jazz was going to go to the bar to get some drinks so uh, I went with him I forget whether he said come with me or I did just went with him I don't know but you know when we got to the bar. <laughs> I was going to tell them, I was going to say, hey, man, you know, like as much as I, I love you guys, I got to say like, you know, all this stuff you're talking about, about you know, <laughs> techno music, technology, destroy music, I, I'm not buying it. And, and yet before I could even open my mouth, he said to me, you know, hey, I have been thinking about, you know, you playing keyboards with us on, on the next tour. So, uh, yeah, I just kind of like at that point zipped it, you know, and we went back. <laughs> uh, <to Europe. laughs> One of those moments. And I, we were back. <laughs> And, and it was as if the other guys knew that this was, this proposal was happening because as soon as we got back with the drinks, uh, Jordy was like, well, well you know, uh, welcome aboard, you know, and things like that. I was like, what? You know, I didn't even say yes. I was just like, I was just like stupefied. So uh, <laughs> I just kind of like at that point, well, it was getting late and I'm like, I got to go. I got to work in the morning. I never even said yes or anything. I just kind of like just walked out of there thinking like, I think I just, you know, joined Killing Joke. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, but it was um, about a whole year of waiting because, you know, they had just fin finished touring and they were going to be preparing to do another record. So it was it was like this really long wait period. But uh, but yeah, it did, it did happen. And uh, I ended up, you know, quitting my job and buying a, uh, a plane ticket to London. I'd never been out of the country. Um, uh, you know, this was like... Um, you know, really uh, a bold, a bold move, but you know, I, uh, I just felt like, uh, you know, this, this is it. You know, yeah, so, it's, the, it's the choices that you, if you didn't do it, you will regret it. Yeah, your sure. Entire life. Yeah, I don't <laughs> think there was much chance of that, but I, but the story continues. You know, uh, 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 you know, uh, flights to London from New York. You know, you travel overnight. You don't sleep really. So yeah. I arrived in the morning and. Um, a long journey from Gatwick to, to into London. Uh, I didn't know what I was doing. I was carrying a huge keyboard and a road case, a sampler, oh, um, yeah. I had a suitcase. I had a hard drive and a briefcase, all this stuff. I couldn't, and I didn't have any like English money to get one of those little carts. So I was kind of like, literally like moving things six feet at a time and, 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 and trying to get through Victoria station to, wow. to where, to where Martin was. Yeah, it's not like, it's not like now that you, yeah. you, you need a laptop and a computer. Yeah, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. And, oh, cool. uh, so yeah, so I was pretty worn out. Uh, Martin met, met me at Victoria station. We hopped the cab back to the rehearsal studio. Everybody was like really excited. Um, you know, and, um, and uh you know I, I busted out my you know my my keyboard and my sampler and this is stuff that they you know, were, you know really new technology and uh, that they were not you know that familiar with and you know i was kind of like the new blood you know they were like um this this is awesome but then uh my second day uh, everything kind of just came crashing down um i arrived that they that are their jazz the morning guy so they they start early like it was like 9 a.m sharp you know so i would have to it took me two hours to get there every morning so it was like a long journey and um and i arrived and um you know ready to go and jazz was just sitting there like yeah you know i've been thinking like you know maybe this isn't going to work out after all no, <laughs> like, well, i just got here <laughs> he was like yeah i don't know i just don't know you know and i was like okay well you know and the guys were like you know, hey, the guy, you know, you asked the guy to come, he came, you know, like, you give him a shot, you know, so he's like, okay, okay, so he, he said, we're gonna play a song, you know, and it was one of the ones that, you know, it wasn't on a record, but I had heard them play it, it was um, a song called uh, The Beautiful Dead, which was uh, to be off of the upcoming record that we're supposed to be working on, Extremities, yeah. uh, 
and dirt and various regressed emotions. So, uh, unfortunately, I, I you know I'd heard them play the song a bunch of times, and and that's all I had to go on. And I watched him play it. He had two Oberheim OBXs um, from you know the, from from the, the early days that they used on the early records, and and uh, I just uh, I was like, well, this this is it. You know, I better pay attention here. Um, and had no time to get nervous or or anything like that. I was like, this is this is a make it or break it moment. So he uh, played the song, you know one hand on each keyboard, one playing the top line, one playing the bass line. And I kind of knew the groove and, you know, I kind of, you know, felt it in my soul. I don't really, I mean, don't, I mean, I kind of started out reading music, but I, I, I'm not, I don't really, you know, uh, read or write, you know, musical notation. Um, I play by ear. Right, so, it. yeah. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, I just, uh, I said, he, he's, he played it once and then uh, he said, okay, your turn. And I stepped up and, uh, the band played it and I played it and I nailed it, you know, and they're like, okay, you know, like, you know, so what's, what's the problem here? And still jazz was like, yeah, you know, I'm still just not sure <laughs> about this guy. Fuck. Oh, fuck. So every day I had to, uh, I had to work very hard and, um, mm. and prepare, uh, you know, uh, it was one of the hardest things I had to do. And he was very, uh, aggressive too. He would like, kick and spit and and like throw things and push and shove and and i was like man this, this guy's like out of control you know <laughs> I was thinking like, maybe so it's, it's not, not just a, <laughs> yeah, it's not just a character it's not yeah, that character uh, that he performed on the stage he's uh, really I, uh, I he's really know. that crazy well kind mm, of he, he, uh, uh, all I can tell you, some of it I think is his persona and okay. and uh, and whatnot. Deep down, I, I don't think he's crazy at all. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, he he puts on that image, and and um, and uh, perhaps there might be a little bit to it. <laughs> anyway, uh, nonetheless, uh, I, I did uh, understand. Okay, look, I'm the new guy. I get it. But hey, I'm a human being, and I'm not going to be you know pushed around and and like shoved and stuff. So I was like, okay, you know, we're going to set some boundaries here. Like you can do whatever you want, but you know, don't touch me. You know, so um, so we kind of had yeah. this little, little arrangement, and um, and uh, and each day I would work and work and work, and um, you know, gradually, uh, you know, it took a long time, but you know, it, you know, it came together, and and he ultimately, uh, you know, relaxed and uh, understood that you know I was going to be able to do it. So yeah, uh, it was um, it was touch and go there for a bit. But like like you said, what was I going to do? Gonna kind of say, oh yeah, just pack up and go home then what and say, oh, yeah once i had this shot at you know some, my, <laughs> my, my total dream you know come true but i it's yeah. too hard I was I this close <laughs> decided to come home you know and decided not to yes. do it you know no I, so so yeah I, I hung in there and i told myself look if oh, you can, great if you can do this you could do anything and and that proved to be very true because uh, i've worked for some you know um you know you know working with ministry with al jorgensen working with uh, prong with tommy victor you know i mean by then you know i was kind of you know ready ready you know um and uh, had, had uh and had you know uh become you know uh kind of comfortable in, in, in working in these types of situations and and mm -hmm. and was you know more and more prepared and and had more experience so yeah it just it sure. just really helped me so, helped me so after killing joke was what was next well uh actually it was a band called murder inc which was pretty much everybody in killing joke except jazz and chris Connolly on vocals it was uh, supposed to be a killing joke record but then jazz and jordy had some sort of falling out and okay. uh we decided hey we have you know we have this studio time and we're going to make a record. So let's just make a record, you know? And then Chris Connolly, uh, Martin had Chris Connolly uh, do vocals and obviously it, it wasn't killing joke. I mean, um, so well, we, the same. we called it uh, murder Inc. And um, it was really uh, just one record because uh, as soon as we finished it, uh, jazz and Jordy made up and, and, um, and, uh, uh, also reunited with uh with youth um to make the pandemonium record so uh so murder inc was supposed to be like this new project the phoenix rising from the ashes and and we arrived for some shows in england only in, in the music press uh you'd see the big page for murder inc and you'd turn it and then suddenly it was like killing joke reunion pandemonium i was like what you know? <laughs> so it was really kind of strange but uh, uh the, the writing on the wall was that um that uh um 
things had changed. And um, uh, so Paul Rabin, uh, the bass player, he and I uh, by then had, had bonded um, quite a bit. And um, he... Is a bass player or prunk? If I... Well, actually, from Killing Joke, he, he was the What? second. Yeah, Paul Rabin also. was the, the second bass player uh, for Killing Joke um, when Youth um, left the band in the early 80s. So Rabin was in Killing Joke from like 83. Okay. Uh, 84. I that. Yeah, sure. Up until, um, well, he was not on that... Uh, the tour that I first met them on. Um, but when I uh, joined the band uh, in London, he came back to play bass for the Extremities album. And that's the first time I met him. And uh, like I said, he and I bonded uh, mm -hmm. quite a bit. And so um, Murder Inc. kind of collapsed and he uh, had been uh doing some remix work for prong he had kind of met them you know through the touring process uh, sometimes just like literally uh writing on dressing room walls you know like uh uh you know hey what's up prong and they were like oh hey what's up you know and and that's how <laughs> he he kind of built this relationship with them and then uh after these remixes they were preparing for what was to be uh, the cleansing album and uh at the time by then um a lot of bands were looking to get into sampling and uh and uh, yeah the well, industrial so the industrial sound was kind of you know like ministry was, yeah ministry and nine inch nails were blowing up and so they wanted um someone uh to do sampling and of course raven said well you know hey uh That you, you get you know that you got to meet this guy uh jb you know he played with killing joke and they're like oh yeah awesome you know so they came over to my apartment uh ted and and tommy uh with a little four track porta studio that uh, uh tommy had recorded the demos on and uh they were very impressed with my studio by then i had you know a whole arsenal of samplers and um, and synthesizers you know some pretty you know high-end stuff you know uh big polyphonic synthesizers of the day and um and uh ted i'm I, i was like i don't know you know it's like metal i don't listen to heavy metal and i don't know what's up here you know <laughs> and uh after talking to ted uh, i knew well these guys know their shit i mean tommy and ted they they knew all the cool bands you know everything you know, all the industrial bands everything they're not just metal heads in fact you know this You know, they kind of probably weren't necessarily even labeled as metal at that time, um, more alternative or something. I don't know. But mm. anyway, uh, I, I did feel comfortable um, and I heard the this material. And, and when I heard uh, Tommy play Snap Your Fingers, Snap Your Neck, I'm like, yeah, this one's pretty catchy. This one, this, this song, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I could get into this. So, um, yeah, um, yeah, it looked like we were... Um, you know we were connecting and so we uh went into uh some you know rehearsals and and uh, pre-production uh for the record and uh and uh this was interesting because you know with killing joke i just played the songs you know um i yeah. had um, some minor contributions of my own on the extremities record which was you know, monumental for someone you know mm. it was like you know 25 But years with old killing, with killing joke with everything was played Oh, there oh, were, yeah. oh, oh, yeah. Oh, 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 no. Yeah, everything was live. No, no, no programming, no, no backing no, tracks. Uh, no, nothing like that. That, that technology uh, really didn't really didn't exist uh, yet. Um, and uh, there was no click tracks, no, um, no, nothing. It was all played uh, the keyboard and and the things that I contributed, um, the sampling mm -hmm. um, and even some loops. And, and I did use some some sequencing. Um, uh you know uh on uh, the song inside the termite mound which was one that i got to contribute on quite quite a bit oh, uh, so cool. yeah so we were playing to um to some live sequences and loops uh so yeah uh we were breaking some boundaries but no this was all live and and but like i was saying um jazz was the keyboard player so you know i was playing his parts um i was just you know so um uh with murder inc uh I got to step up and, and kind of, you know, be, you know, do my own thing. And, and it was interesting because, um, you know, I was kind of new still. And, uh, so Jordy, uh, actually, um, 
you know, he, he helped me uh, with some amazing chords that worked with his guitars and Raven come up with some really cool ideas and Martin and like everybody kind of you know, helped me along a little bit through that Murder Inc. record. And then with Prong, you know, it was kind of like I, I was more on my own. They were just kind of like, you know, hey, you know, um, we, we're not sure where we're going here, but, um, you know, uh, they were talking about like say ZZ Top, you know. They 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 um, integrated some electronics in their music um, and uh, and uh, and ZZ I was, Top. Yeah, sure. They uh, they had um, uh, one of the first metal bands to really uh, introduce electronics. If you listen to it, um, it's pretty impressive. Um, and so, all right. Uh, and of course, Ministry Nine Inch Nails, but also say uh, Neubauten. Um, I, uh, I, I, yeah. I I think I brought like a like a you know a Neubauten vibe in as well just to, for good measure and um and uh so there was a lot of clanking and scraping going on yeah and, that, and, that, <laughs> that was great because with with metal you can sometimes just do some beautiful chords uh, and, mm -hmm. and no it was it was really so was you who was uh, bringing the samples and yeah yeah they pretty record? much yeah they pretty much just let me do whatever and um, we worked with producer Terry Date who have done uh, Pantera you know, yeah Pantera White Zombie mm -hmm. uh, so um, uh, he's an incredible producer so uh, you know I got to work with him and and see his production techniques and and um, uh, that being said, uh, the Murder Inc. record was produced by Steve Albini, um, another great producer. Uh, once again, also uh, observed his production techniques, miking um, techniques, and you know, the, he, he, you know Steve Albini is known for his you know vintage mics, and and uh, and so you know I was taking notes and and learning because I was like, hey, one day I'm gonna I'm gonna produce, you know what I mean? So I was <laughs> I was thinking, this is this is uh, really good stuff to, to to learn and work with these people, and so yeah, so um, Prong was poised, uh, you know, for a, a big release on a major label uh epic and um hmm. and uh we were supposed to tour with white zombie and ultimately uh pantera you know we all shared the same management company and um and so yeah uh it was a pretty big deal and um and uh our first tour we supported the bad brains which was an amazing tour and then I said, like i said we did white zombie then uh that summer we did uh the uh uh, Pantera Far Beyond Driven Tour with Sepultura, um, which uh, still to this day, people are talking about that tour. It was a mega tour. Um, and How we was did, touring uh, with Pantera? It was amazing. I mean, that's the guys, <laughs> wonderful, wonderful uh, guys. They were there at the, at the peak of their career. And, um, you know, they debuted at number one with a bullet um, billboard. Uh, you know, metal was huge. Um, this was a big... But they were big, cool guys? Oh, yeah. On the road? Amazing. Yeah, all of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, then suddenly I was this metal guy, you know, so yeah, that's <laughs> uh, crazy. even though I never, never, never listened to heavy metal. So, um, so yeah, so, um, prong, uh, we had a big year. Um, uh, we also headlined, uh, uh Europe and the U S um, um, uh, we had three videos on MTV. Um, mm. and then, um, uh, we were, at the tail end we're talking about uh the next record and and you know what kind of direction we wanted to go in mm -hmm. and um uh um that uh that christmas uh after we finished touring that record uh raven and ted came to, to my uh studio and mm -hmm. um we tinkered around with some ideas uh and um i continued to uh to work on some ideas uh and was sending them to tommy he had relocated suddenly to la and so um oh, you know, okay. that was kind of weird because you know they okay. were based out of out of new york and by then i i had just moved out of new york into pennsylvania it's happened but, a lot or, or not that people but, from new york go to la and uh, they kind I, of change <laughs> yeah, well i mean uh like an yeah, ego it, boost <laughs> uh a lot of bands did um it seemed like la if you really wanted to you know um do things you had to go there at this time it was just the dawn of globalization so mm. you kind of had to be you know but i had just moved out of the city to um back to the country so i was taking a big step i just decided i ha had enough of urban life and um mm. 
And so it was a little scary because, you know, like I was like, man, I spent my whole life trying to get out of the sticks and here I am moving back to the sticks. Like, am I sure about this? But like I said, I, I, I envisioned, you know, globalization. This was even before the internet, uh, but um, we had like overnight delivery. So, I mean, I could get Tommy a, a tape overnight, you know, to, to listen to, but, you know, I wasn't getting much feedback from any of this material that I was oh. sending. And uh, after talking to management, it just seemed like, you know, things were kind of in limbo and nothing was really happening. So I was like, okay, you know, I'm just going to keep doing my thing, writing music and trying to think about what, you know, what I would, you know, offer to this next record. And then one day I get this call from the manager saying, hey, you know, Hmm. these guys decided that they don't really need you anymore (laughs) or want you anymore or whatever. I don't know. Just like decided they were, you know, uh, that I was not going to be part of this next record. So it was kind of a big shock. Uh, Mm. They didn't really talk to me about it or, you know, nobody would even return my phone calls. I just wanted to say like, you know, like, you know, what's up, you know, did you not get any of this material? I thought it was pretty good, but maybe (laughs) I don't know if Tommy ever even listened to it. I don't know, but uh, yeah, maybe they, they just wanted to, you know, follow the trend like you say at that moment. Well, uh, after eventually Ray, Paul Raven and I kind of, you know, uh, reconnected okay. in, in, around the, uh, the, the fear factory time, um, which was later, but, uh, he said, yeah, um, this was a very difficult time for them. Um, uh, he had, uh, injured his spine. Like uh, one of the last shows we did in LA, he was, we were at some bar and he was outside climbing a tree and i remember seeing him fall out of a tree and land on his head and what uh, turned out he, he did some very serious damage he, uh yeah so he was um he was unable to move for a long time he couldn't make Ooh, it to what's, rehearsal uh, tommy no raven Paul. ah raven yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. so raven. um so he said that you know tommy was just like you know what the fuck why aren't you coming to rehearsals and Raymond's like, I can't move, you know? And so he, he you know, he, he thought maybe he was fired too. He, that's why he stopped going. He's like, you know, I thought, you know, wow. they just replaced me, but it turns out they were still waiting for him. But and nonetheless, they did um, make a follow-up record. Uh, um, but uh, yeah, uh, they started to tour it. Um, this was before OzFest was called OzFest. It was, uh, I think, still Ozzy or, you know, something like that. But uh, yeah, uh, from what I understand, the label by then was disappointed with record sales and didn't Mm. really feel like, you know, they wanted to, you know, get behind this band anymore. So they kind of pulled the plug on the tour support and, 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 uh, and uh, dropped them. And so the band uh, kind of uh, disintegrated um, that following year. So in a way, Mm. You know, I looked at it as like, okay, well, kind yeah. of like getting off the Titanic, I guess, <laughs> before. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so uh, uh, I, I had to kind of start over, you know, like, well, now what am I going to do? And and um, I kind of thought about getting back out to touring, but um, uh, just nothing was really kind of lining up. And I decided uh, it was time to do my own thing. And uh, I had my own studio and uh, uh, some uh, local bands who were learning about me um, were calling me up and saying, hey, you know, do you record bands? Do you produce? Mm-hmm. I'm like, well, not really. But then it was like, well, hey, you know, why not? So I said, where no, were no. your your studio on that time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This where, was, where? This would have been, uh, well, uh, I bought the place in, in 1994, but this by then, uh, it was the following year, 1995. So um, I started producing and recording bands in, in my studio, the one that you were in, um, in Pennsylvania. In, uh, in oh, my, the same studio, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I in was 19, there. Yes, in 1995, <laughs> uh, uh, I started uh, producing uh, and recording bands there. And, um, and also... I can share with the people my experience because sure. it was amazing. Yeah. Because uh, yeah, just I, I don't want to interrupt you just a little break because mm-hmm. uh, the studio of John is uh, is amazing. He have he is like a, a, a synthesizer and sampler museum. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like I don't know how how much money you have there. Well, uh, I'm sure a, a collector could. Well, here's the story uh, quickly about that: is that when when those when when those when I bought those uh, now vintage synthesizers mm. um, and uh, and and samplers, uh, 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 they uh, they were already out of fashion. Like um, uh, mm. uh, 
some of them were made before MIDI was invented and, oh, okay. uh, and, uh, they were, um, known to be temperamental and, um, not stay in tune and um people wanted these new things these akai samplers and sure. e emaxes and um sure. there yeah so so i was able to to, to buy up jupiter 8 and um Oberheim's oh, and ppgs um basically for, for 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 dirt cheap because nobody wanted them at that time now if wow. you go on ebay and you look up these synthesizers they're going for 10 to fifteen thousand yes. dollars even twenty thousand um, dollars yeah it's crazy for some of these vintage synthesizers so yeah i got i got them at the right time and held on to them so yeah i mean you got to to see it no that's great so you can continue. I just wanted to. Oh, share. okay. Well, yeah. So, so that's my studio. You were there, and um, mm -hmm. uh, it's been now twenty-five years that I've been recording and producing bands, as well as working on my own material. So, um, in those years after Prong, um, I started taking some of that material that I had written um, for the Prong record and built upon that, and also upon my electronic uh, music um, background. Um, and was making kind of combining techno music and industrial music and um, trying to find a, a sound and was actually you know finding it and then i began collaborating with um with a friend who i had met um after moving back to pennsylvania named brian Brot. uh he was a young man uh very computer savvy he he grew up in the computer business. His parents opened a computer store in the mid seventies when nobody even knew what computers were. And so he was born into it. So he I was a, a computer wizard. And he also, um, you know, had uh, a nice selection of synthesizers and drum machines and, and was dabbling in, uh, techno music. And, um, and so we quickly, um, started kind of joining forces and, uh, collaborating, um, uh, he was actually um, also uh, set up in my studio. Um, and so we had two little studios and then we started to kind of merge together. And um, uh, at first just doing our each doing our own thing and just being friends. But then one day I was outside and I heard him, you know, putting something together. It's really quite interesting. And I was like, because uh, we had some common threads, uh, you know, that, that, that we did seem uh, to, to have. And, and I, I just said, yeah, you know, um, uh, let me get in there and uh, see what he's doing. And uh, I told him, yeah, I, I like this, you know, groove you got going on. I said, how about if I um, program the rhythm? And he goes, yeah, sure. So I jumped in, he had a, a TR 909. Uh, and right. uh, fired it up and I started programming the, the rhythm. And um, uh, this was uh, what became the song False Icons, which mm. was even before we were a band and, and named the band that, this was just the first kind of collaboration that we had. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, then, you know, um, I was, uh, uh, I got a call um, from Fear Factory uh, asking if I'd be interested in, in uh, being their uh, touring keyboardist. And so like just when I thought like I wasn't looking for a gig and wasn't interested well. in touring, um, boom, you know? So yeah, I knew about Fear Factory and heard their music, I a lot of respect for them. And uh, uh, they flew me out to Vancouver. Uh, they were finishing up the obsolete record. Um, uh, turns out that uh, Reese Fulber uh, was the one that recommended me because he remembered me from Killing Joke, um, Frontline okay. Assembly. Yeah, Frontline yeah. Uh, Assembly and Killing Joke did some shows together when I was uh, in really? Killing Joke. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this would have been early 91. Um, uh, yeah, and then, of course, he did, uh, because I had kind of a ho high profile um, uh, gig with Prong, he saw me on MTV. He's like, that's that guy from Killing Joke. Uh, or, and then <laughs> uh, Fear Factory's like, you know, we need a keyboard player. And he's like, well, you know, find this guy. So they, they did. They tracked me down through our our management, our old, well, what, you know, the management company that, that had handled Prong and, uh, and their manager called me and, uh, and told me who he was and asked me if I was interested. And I was like, yeah. So they flew me out to That's Vancouver. Awesome. Um, I got to, you know, uh, uh, <clears throat> meet up with Reese again and, um, and meet the band for the first time. And, uh hear the music uh for the from the new record uh, it was amazing because they had uh, done a collaboration with gary newman they they did a remake of cars 
And so yeah, Gary, that was Gary awesome. Newman, uh, not only did he uh, contribute, uh, or, you know, uh, also uh, uh, sing and collaborate on the Cars remake and, and be, in, be in the video, he also did some, some spoken word dialogue on one of the other tracks, I think for the song Obsolete, yeah, that's him in the beginning um, talking. So Is uh, he? yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so I got to meet Gary Newman and I was in the video. Uh, one, we went back out to Vancouver to, to do the video. And so, uh, it was a very exciting time and, um, uh, Fear Factory, this was a, you know, monumental record for them, the, the follow-up to Demanufacture, which had really made an impact, um, on industrial metal and, uh, you know, um, uh, their unique blend of, uh, um, death metal and electronics and industrial uh, was, uh, you know, really something uh, special. And yeah, and I remember, I remember Obsolete is that. It's like a whole, it's like a concept album. It's yes. like a whole story. Uh... Yeah, so what's interesting is, you know, Reese, uh, you know, really went all out on that record. They uh, mm. used, um, you know, orchestral uh sounds and um much more uh electronics and keyboards than they had done before and so they had had a couple different keyboard players but they felt like it was time for someone you know who could really handle like all of this stuff that they were doing and they needed someone you know with a lot of experience and mm. they came they came to me and it was just uh you know um uh, the right time, um, for me to get back out there. And yeah, I had, you know, the, you know, the skills, um, you know, to, to, you know, I had to like literally, uh, sample everything from dat tapes you know it was still pretty pretty but, primitive we were using zip drives and things um but was rick fulver who tell you yeah you you need to play this part no or, no 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 he just like no, figure it out <laughs> oh yeah 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 he just gave me a dat tape and he goes here you go this is everything you need and then i had to do the rest so i had to sample okay. Yeah, I had to learn the song. I had to listen to the songs. I had to learn them. I had to um, also like listen to these dat tapes. It was just the the stuff that like the tracks. You know, there wasn't individual. And you have to sound. recreate the sound. Yeah, I had to. No. Um, so let's say there was like a keyboard part, right? I yeah. didn't get individual notes or anything like that. No, no programs or anything. I had so no patches. No nothing. nothing. So what I did was I took. Um, <laughs> samples from individual notes off of the dats and then i had to you know loop them you know crossfade looping you know, really had yeah. to you know uh get it just right so that i could play the sound the exact sound you know i was using a kurzweil learning the kurzweil um sampler uh keyboard and um and uh and had to recreate the patches from you know just taking a little snippet off of the the, the dat tape but then all of the other stuff like say specific you know, samples or things, you know, I was able to capture and, and, um, and I had to map everything, um, myself and, and, um, and had to, uh, you know, layer, lay, layer things and figure out how I was going to, you know, play all this stuff. And then, um, you know, on some songs like the song resurrection, I was playing, you know, all the orchestra using the, the Kurzweil, you know, string orchestral strings. And so I had oh, to have, okay areas of the keyboard, you know, just to play strings and then also areas of the keyboard, you know, to play the individual samples and, and, uh, and so, yeah, it's very sophisticated stuff. Um, and there were some programming or backing tracks or? No, no, oh no, no, this still, what? still long before, long before anything like that. No, this was live. I played everything live. With no a, click. With a no, click? No, no click. No, no, no click. What no. the fuck? No, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So what's funny is, um, you know, like all bands, they tend to play a little fast um, live. So um, some of the samples were kind Another of lagging. Thing. Yeah. The, the Some of the samples were kind of, you know, so I would I would do this thing where I would use the pitch wheel to kind of speed the sample up because you wouldn't notice wow. the pitch too much, but you would notice that it was out of time. So um, a lot of times I had to nudge uh, some of the samples with the pitch wheel to try to keep them in time. And only once did somebody ever confront me. It was in uh, Vancouver. Uh, somebody said, you know, uh, what's up, man? I noticed, you know, sometimes the samples were drifting. I'm like, dude, man, I'm playing that shit. I'm trying to <laughs> keep, keep up with the band, trying to, you know, use the pitch wheel to, to kind of nudge That's the amazing. samples. Yeah. And they're like, oh, okay. I didn't know yeah. that. <laughs> That, uh, my respect to oh, you okay. because well, 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 it, it's well. really uh, yeah now these days that probably well really uh, really hurts 
And well, especially with that kind of music, when the drummer is so fast mm -hmm. and oh, yeah. he makes yeah. so complex patterns, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. You, well, you uh, that was one of the things about playing with Prong and, and Killing Joke was it prepared me, you know, for, mm -hmm. for that level of... Um, of playing and so yeah um i was uh, i was definitely um the guy for the job and i was ready ready for the task um uh and just to jump ahead quickly of course you know ministry same thing they were when i joined uh playing um live uh, just using the samples now this time was different in that we were using click um oh, sure. Uh, to, because that's the only way to keep the music, you know, keep that from happening where the, the samples would drift. So, um, so ministry, sorry, but the people of Fair Factory, he knew a little how it worked the stuff, or he just he he has some knowledge of sampling. Are we talking about Reese? No, 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 no. Uh, the members like uh, oh no, they Martha. they uh, oh you you we're talking Fear Factory now. Yeah. Yeah, no, they um, they entrusted me. They they did not know um, this technology so much. Uh, they had worked with you know keyboard players before, but this was um, something even more advanced. So yeah, they pretty much just left it up to me. They're like, you know, you're you're on your own. You, know? so, <laughs> you do your stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you you know, uh, and uh, and then um, in rehearsals, um, it actually went went, went quite well. Uh, um, uh, I, I don't remember it being. Um, uh, that too terribly stressful for something like that uh, at, at that level. But um, here's a funny story. Um, my first my first shows uh, with Fear Factory, the very first show was a sold out show in Holland, um, over 2000 people. And uh, Reese Fulber flew in um, for these shows. So he was standing behind me on stage no, when I was performing. No yeah. <laughs> uh, and the next show, the very next night, uh, we played Ozfest London, sold out, forty thousand wow. people. So once again, I was on stage uh, with Reese Fulber standing behind me. I don't know if they were like, you know, hey, you might have to jump in if this guy. <laughs> 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 he wouldn't know what to do. He didn't know what to understand. He had no idea what where my samples were mapped. Uh, you know, so uh, yeah. uh, uh, I, I think that just he was just there to just to witness it. Um, and mm -hmm. and they 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 you know they just had to put put their trust in me and uh, and and I I delivered. Uh, but yeah, that was um, quite a show. It was. Um, Main stage, Ozfest, uh, London, sold out. Uh, uh, we were the first band on, and then uh, after us was Soulfly, and then uh, Pantera, and then Slayer, uh, and then um, wow. Uh, uh, I, it was supposed to be some. There was a there was a, a change up there. I believe it was Therapy, uh, and then Foo Fighters, and then Ozzy. And then Black Sabbath, all wow. on the same, all on the same stage. That's a huge uh, bill. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So there's no, like no pressure there, right? And then, <laughs> uh, uh, from that from that point on, yeah, we were um, touring uh, uh, the U.S., Europe, and for the first time, uh, I traveled to Japan and Australia and New Zealand. So that was really exciting. Wow. Um, yeah. And I thought was that period touring with the uh, Fur Factory. It was great. I mean, um, uh, you know. Uh, Any funny um, stories? Well, uh, <laughs> not so funny. I remember uh, um, Burton and Dino had some kind of blowout one night. I was in the back of the bus working um, on some music on a laptop and had the headphones on, and I heard this, you know crazy commotion going on. I look back and they, they're almost like literally like, you know, like, you know, punching match or something, but uh, I don't know. So I just went back to work. I was like, I, okay. not, not my, my, to my yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but no, we, um, uh, like I said, uh, you know, went to Japan. I, I, it was my first time in Japan. They had been there, but, uh, it was also my first time in Australia. So that, that was exciting. And New Zealand. And we went back there on the Digimortal record. So, um, this was, uh, you know, a pretty big deal. You know, uh, they were at, uh, you their career was at its peak um uh uh they're a pretty big deal and uh but uh but nonetheless um you know i was just this kind of touring live keyboard player guy i wasn't really you know in the band i wasn't really part of you know yeah. everything i was like left out of band photos and videos so really? I, yeah yeah i kind of felt like a little bit like i was just kind of like never this, conversations about that 
Mm, well, I mean, I didn't know what they were offering me when I took the job. I just assumed that, like, like say, with Prong, I was just in the band. Now, Killing Joke was similar in that I was just a touring member. I was not okay. um, a feature. You know, I was not I was not in the band. It, it, mm. So, I mean, um, it was very similar to that. And, and, and so I didn't really know what I was getting into, but I kind of figured it out. And I'm like, oh, okay, I kind of get it. And I'm like, whatever, it's their, mm. it's their band. And, you know, they call the shots. I'm, I'm a paid member. And, hey, sometimes getting paid is better because you know the, um, when you're yeah, in, you avoid all the fighting yeah uh, well plus if you're in the band you know uh, when you make money you make money but when you don't make money you don't make money so you know yes. but when you're a, a touring uh you know a live member you know you, you're getting a pay a regular paycheck so that's what i what i needed i you know um and yeah so, of course uh, it was a job um and uh and so and i, I think you, you learn with every experience mm -hmm. yeah but i'm not gonna lie i'm gonna say uh, i started to feel kind of like a little like maybe um i had more to offer or that mm. i should you know perhaps you know you know, be playing, you know, more of a role after many years of touring with this sure. band. Um, so uh, it did uh, by the archetype record, they were kind of trying to, you know, say, yeah, it's your time. You've earned it. You know, we're going to kind of bring you into the fold. But then quickly they they didn't. So they kind of, uh, wow, you, know, they kinda, you know, yeah. So at that point, I thought, OK, um, I think maybe it's time to move on, you know, uh, hmm. so. Uh, I had already, by then, back to where we're supposed to be talking about false icons, I had already, um, <laughs> by that point, had put false icons together and had um, most of At the, the same material. time? At the same time? Well, you were... there was time off. You see, uh, between the Digimortal record and Archetype, there was two years um, where the band was, like, on hiatus. So mm -hmm. um, that's when I took the chance to uh, to launch false icons and consequently uh, ascension of the watchers which was also made in my studio mm. uh that that first record with burton c bell so um i was working on two projects at the same time launching can you, can you tell us a little about ascension of the watcher because for yeah. me it was so weird when that project came up you know it was like coming from the you know the singer of fear factory mm -hmm. you were expecting a uh, yeah a no. very heavy stuff me and too. me too <laughs> yeah so here's the story so burton and i uh during fear factory did uh become quite close and and um and uh uh when we were on tour during the digimortal album uh we actually had a day off in pennsylvania which is rare to get into that territory um so we rented a car and drove to my house and uh and uh um uh burton was like wow man this is like awesome i totally get why you 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 live here um this is beautiful and um you know i showed him the studio and he's like oh my god you know this is amazing and uh he's like i'd like to come back um and record here and i was like cool yeah no problem so you know yeah. uh that's that that was uh you know all i knew and um um sure enough uh, uh after we finished that uh touring that album uh, he hopped in his truck, his pickup truck, and drove cross country from LA to, to Pennsylvania, wow. and uh, showed up at my show, showed up at my house uh, and, with a guitar. And uh, I was like, okay, well, you know, um, let's get to work. So we went down to my studio, and he pulls out a guitar, electric, an electric guitar, and some um, a multi effects type of. Uh, pedal i thought he was going to whip out some kind of like porta studio and like and have these demos and songs yeah. and i uh, thought it was going to sound like fear factory and yeah, yeah. no he uh Nothing. You know, he pulls out this guitar he puts a whole bunch of echo on it and uh, he starts <laughs> playing um these like you know these ideas and i'm like uh okay <laughs> like um that's that's it you know and he's like yeah <laughs> so i'm like okay you know uh so uh at first you know i was kind of like like you i was like expecting something heavy like fear factory and so uh, but then it made sense i'm like uh, this makes perfect sense no, but it's great because it gives you space to yeah yeah well i mean like i said uh yeah. turns out burton like myself is not a metal guy um it, it, i started to realize that when i stayed with him in la uh looking through his music collection the only yeah. records that could be perceived as metal would have been like black sabbath everything else was really? industrial music and goth music you know nick cave and godflesh and so you know um then i okay. started to think think about it and i'm like okay um 
we might have some common ground here. I'm thinking Joy Division, sure. Early Cure, um, and here I am with you know with all of these uh, wonderful vintage synthesizers and samplers, and 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 not only that, but like a huge collection of uh, of sounds um, mm. uh, from uh, you know Fairlights and Synclaviers and other you know um, uh, you know. Uh, uh, you know, music systems and uh, samplers and synthesizers of, of, of the early 80s and um, decided that, you know, this was uh, the perfect opportunity for me to be able to utilize some of those uh, sounds. And so um, after listening back to these tracks I made of him playing guitar, I'm like, oh, yeah, I mean, this, I can totally hear keyboards and things. And then uh, as far as what we we're going to do from there, uh, I had these dat tapes of uh, drum loops, like, you know, hours and hours and hours of drum loops. And I was like, dude, if you can, you know, sit down and, and like listen through um, all these loops and like jot down the ones you like, I'll go back and sample them and we'll map them out and we'll try to, you know, use them, um, try to get them, you know, in time with some of these tracks and, and build some some rhythms. And that's what we did. And and so that record was really a collaboration of, of me and Burton just um, kind of okay. uh, coming together uh, and uh, find, find, finding finding our sound. And like I said, it, this was at the exact same time that I was launching False Icon. So, I mean, he was uh, um, a big uh, support uh, because this was uh, something that I was kind of... Um, putting together but you know it's it's not easy you know when you played in you know killing joke prong and fear factory to suddenly put out your own band it's kind of intimidating you know like how are you gonna like you know are yeah you gonna like uh you know people are gonna be like uh yeah really you know so uh, I, I really <laughs> i really didn't think about that too much which is actually probably pretty good i decided you know uh, hey this is something i've been doing my whole life um this is something i just need to do i wasn't thinking like it's got to be better than fear factory or killing you know, that, that's impossible you know so i just had to be myself and just find my own you know, direction, but I'm not going to lie. I mean, it's hard to, to be, have a career playing with all those bands and not have a little bit of it rub off on you. Right. So, um, so yeah, so I had a little bit, uh, you know, you might hear a little bit uh, of some of those other bands in there, but, but, but ultimately uh, Fear Factory became, I mean, I'm sorry, False Icons became you know, <laughs> my, my, uh, my, you know, my baby and, uh, yeah. and Ascension of the Watchers was Burton's baby. And they were both hatched out of my studio at the same time. And, and like I said, he, he helped, you know, kind of give me a boost. Like when I was, I was, uh, singing, you know, on, on False Icons, uh, and uh, thankfully, uh, you know, we had auto tune by then, so I was able to, uh, uh, you know, cut, you know, really good vocal tracks quickly and easily. And um, I was feeling kind of confident about uh, my voice for the first time ever, really. And also, you know, I was bringing back my guitar playing um, uh, because, you know, I had been basically playing keyboards um, throughout, you know, the 90s. And so um, uh, this was an exciting uh time and like i said uh, burton you know was big, a big support so you know, for me yeah just like you know he said you know this is good you know you know um uh, so you you, know, you make him listen to your yourself we, we, we were project? doing it at the same time you got to understand uh, both projects were happening in my studio so like one night uh it would be um false icons working on false icons and then the next night burton would come over and it would be ascension of the watchers but some of these nights when it was false icons night, um, Burton would just show up and hang out and be there and hear it and listen and be like, yeah, you, 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 you know, you're, you're onto something here and, you know, you know, go, go, oh, go for that's it. Cool. So, um, yeah, so, uh, so yeah, so that, um, those two years, 2002 and 2003, uh, were, 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 were dedicated to false icons and Ascension of the watchers. Um, and those albums, uh, that we created ultimately did come out, um, after I joined ministry, um, a few years later. Now, see, there was another, um, album cycle, uh, for fear factory. They did get back together this time. It was without Dino. Um, so, uh, I had Christian, uh, on guitar and, oh, yeah. 
So it was a different, you know, it was still Fear Factory, but, you know, a different lineup. And uh, I did I did um, contribute uh, to Archetype um, on some keyboards, and I did tour the first couple of tours. Uh, we went to Australia. We did the Big Day Out. We went to uh, uh, South Korea. We played Seoul with Korn. Um, and then we got the uh, Jägermeister Music Tour with Slipknot. So I did that uh, um, and then decided it was time to you know to for me to 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 move on and so uh i parted ways with fear factory in uh, 2004 uh all once again to kind of pursue false icons and uh we began uh our first shows um that uh, that next year um and uh also uh performing ascension of the watchers we even did some mini tours uh together both bands playing together um and then uh, I got a phone call from Paul Raven. Uh, this would have been, you know, late in the summer of 2005, uh, saying, hey, man, I'm heading to Texas um, with Tommy Victor to make a, a ministry album. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> we might need a keyboard player. So uh, I was like, well, that's weird. You know, I hadn't talked to Tommy <laughs> since Prong and... Uh, just uh, fire me. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, so yeah. So then um, uh, I had heard Houses of the Mole um, and I uh, then uh, subsequently understood that uh, that Al was clean. And, uh, uh, you know, I mean, he, he, no secret that Al, you know, was addicted Wait, to heroin, heroin for a long time. Be before that time, you 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 meet Al Jorgensen. I did. I met Al um, in the Killing Joke days um, through Paul uh, Raven. He was a fan of Killing Joke. Oh, totally. Oh, completely. You know, yeah. Because uh, for me, is the clearly ministry is influenced by Killing Joke. Yes, yes, and uh, Al, you know, would would not deny that, and who would, um, you know, but uh, but uh, but uh, yeah. So um, here's the story that uh, uh, when I first met Al Jorgensen, um, it was at Wax, uh, well, Chicago Tracks um, Recording Studio in Chicago, and uh, Killing Joke also was um, uh, rehearsing there. Um, Martin had relocated there, and um, Raven's like, hey, you know. Go hang out with Al Jorgensen. I'm like, sure. So we went down to Chicago Tracks and we went in and we had to step over junkies and um, people from the street what? who just kind of no. wandered, wandered in there. Yeah, a lot of really? dubious, a lot of dubious activity. Yeah, yeah. And All right. We got into the studio and uh, and there was Al uh, um, uh, running around. Um, he had a guitar. Um, and uh, Critter was was on the the SSL and what's uh, the wrong what year? Then? This was 1991. Hmm. So it was uh, essentially the Psalm 69 sessions. No. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah. So, oh, and Michael Bolsch was standing there um, behind a big, you know, rack of samplers, just kind of like standing there really not doing much of anything because he's just kind of like you know just standing there and uh and i uh, met him for the first time and you meet, uh, uh paul baker too barker might have been there but he wasn't in the studio uh okay it was it, it was and I, but i had met paul and bill and uh, of course chris and um uh, a lot of the guys, uh, but I, I had not met Al yet, um, or my, I, I had never met Mikey until I played in ministry. So anyway, um, this, you were there. Yeah, so I was there, but I had I had met Paul, um, and I had met um, Chris and Bill, you know, quite a few times, and so you know, I, I you know, I knew them uh, fairly well, but I had not met Al. So this was. Um, you know, uh, a pretty big deal because I was a huge ministry, um, revolting Cox, uh, Palehead fan. And so I was 
geeking out, total fanboy, <laughs> you know. And Al was like, uh, settle down, man. You know, he's like, you know, I'm just a regular <laughs> dude. You know, he's like, I don't even know what I'm doing. You know what I mean? He was just like, he was just like so humble and just so, so like, you know, he's like, hey, you know, you can be on this record if you want to. Come on back tomorrow. You know, I'm like, what? <laughs> he's like, yeah, sure. Come on down. I just, oh, I did. But, you know, really, uh, it was pretty crazy. So, so what, what, what was happening was he was running around with his guitar. And I remember I was thinking like, where's the fair light? You know, that's what I wanted see and it was sitting there collecting dust somewhere but you know this was <laughs> you know he was kind of like in metal mode by now you know so uh mm. so yeah so uh he recorded uh, a guitar track and um uh, immediately it was like something's not right i don't think it's in tune uh you know critters like yeah, i don't know and uh and i was like does anybody have a tuner and like you know nobody had a tuner and so he's like Fuck. well I know. Uh, he's like, let's call Bill Riefland. Uh, yeah, he has perfect pitch. He'll know. So they called Bill on the phone no. uh, in Seattle and played him the track and asked him if it was in tune. He goes, yeah, no, it's not in tune. And then I was like, okay, hangs up the phone. He goes like, well, fuck, can't you just put it through a harmonizer? And they're like, Al, you're going to have to tune the guitar and replay <laughs> it. And he's just like, fuck, you know, so <laughs> and, uh, uh, it turns Too out. It turns out that that was a, that that became the song "Cracking Up" by Revolt and Cox. It was not it did not it was not a ministry song. So yeah, so that's the way he worked. You know, you just never knew what was going to happen. He was just in the studio and he just like experiment a lot. Yes, yeah, yeah. So I mean, he's the same people uh, in the band. So you know, if it if it ended up being you know just not really ministry material, then it was Revco material. So you know that's how he operated. But yeah, so I did go back a second time. But yeah, it was more of the same madness, and uh, I was just like, yeah, I, you know, I don't know that. You know, it was so <laughs> so that uh, that first night, you know, um, uh, after the session, we went uh, to get some drinks, and you know, of course, in that were, moment, you were kind of, I don't know, surprised. Uh, I knew you were expecting something else. No, no, I I knew uh, 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 that that ministry because uh, Martin had played with ministry and told me okay. you know yeah there's a lot of a lot of you know hard drugs going around there you know and, and okay. you know hey I'm you know I like to party don't get me wrong but yeah no that this was something like way out of my league I was like yeah sure. I don't know and um and uh. And so it, it was not, you know, I don't know, it just, you know, I was, I was doing Killing Joke. I was quite happy doing that. And uh, it was great to meet these guys and, and, and to be able to, you know, to, to see ministry in their heyday. And I remember uh, one night we went to see Public Enemy and um, really? it was, yeah, it was a big deal. Anthrax and I forget who else was on, but uh, it was at the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Agora uh, um, or the Aragon. I forget. I think it's the Agora. So anyway, um, uh, I remember we were like way up in the nosebleed section and uh, just the killing joke guys and we barely got in on the guest list. And then I looked down and I see Paul Barker and Bill Rieflin walk in like royalty. You know, they just like walk right in. Everybody knows them. And they walk right into the, the sound booth area and, you know, had like, you know, uh, you know, like I said, the, the the royal red carpet treatment, and I was like, "Fuck, I want to be in ministry." Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so uh, so yeah, so um, that was part of this uh, Chicago scene uh, circa 1991, um, and uh, uh, there was a lot of bands, um, you know, coming out of that uh, out of that scene, and so that was an exciting time. But yeah, like I said, um, flash forward. There I am living out in the country, and uh, I had uh, quite a run, qu quite a run with Fear Factory, um, uh, and I get this phone call from Raven saying about uh, you know this this uh, new album with Tommy Victor on it, and and, uh, and 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 I I had heard Houses of the Mole. In fact, I tried to catch that tour. I came through Pennsylvania, but uh, I didn't. I didn't ultimately make it. But uh, but it was my understanding uh, that Al had gotten clean, and I'm thinking like, well, and even before I knew that, when I saw the uh, Mole record, um, I was like, something said, you know, because I mean, to be honest, uh, I I did not follow ministry through the the post um psalm era too much i mm. mean uh, i remember phil you mean when they split with uh paul baker uh, yeah no. i'm talking about uh filth pig 
Dark Side of the Spoon, uh, uh, Animositas Amina. I'm talking about that era. I did not necessarily follow ministry. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> uh, yeah, a lot of people might say that, but, you know, like in hindsight, you know, I've rediscovered the Filth Pig record and, and I realized yeah. because I think the problem was that we all wanted. Uh, was um, too different. We, well, yeah, we were all expecting uh, Psalm 69 or yeah. uh, Psalm, Psalm 70. That's what Al, Al refers to it as. We were all expecting Psalm 70 and we didn't <laughs> get it. So, yeah. So, yeah, but he, he was doing something different. And um, it and was now, great. Yeah, yes, I, we. I, now, well, now yeah. the, the same, like you, I rediscovered those albums, and you can yeah. feel that. Well, uh, yeah, for, uh, well, um, for that matter, uh, on the, um, on the, uh, the, uh, the From Beer to Return a Tour, um, we, uh, 2015 tour, we were actually listening to Filth Big a lot, and we were thinking like the, about trying to, you know, kind of revisit some some of the concepts, some of the some of the elements mm -hmm. of that record. So on um, the American album, we 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 were trying to to bring back um, some of the, some some of some of that, and we actually started playing uh, the song Filth Big, and and uh, and uh, and then. Uh, also, we brought back uh, Bad Blood from, uh, yeah. from Dark Side of the Spoon, which was also a little gem that I kind of missed out on uh, because um, that that album, uh, I was expecting something different as well. And um, and uh, and so uh, uh, Animas Disamina, you know, uh, something I didn't quite know what where he was going. But when I saw Mole, something said this record uh, i need to get it and i did i ordered it right away and something told me that that i would be happy and and i was and it did feel like uh, uh like psalm 70 maybe finally so yeah uh, so then tommy victor's riffing out on it and mm -hmm. um and so uh yeah so you know they offered me uh well first you know raven just said heads up you know uh, this was in uh like late summer of 2005 and to be honest you know heads up in the music industry doesn't pay your bills you know so, so i kind of yeah. forgot i kind of forgot about it and then that uh christmas like literally the day after christmas he calls me and he starts reading off tour dates and i'm trying to write them down and i'm like what the fuck is going on here dude i'm running out of paper <laughs> this is like <laughs> six months of touring I, I don't know you know i i had um two children i had two young children um and uh i wasn't sure if i was so going this to was kind of another level of touring for you well no but um when i did fear factory i had uh, my my first daughter was uh, seven months old, and then we had uh, my second daughter during the the Fear Factory years. Um, but but um, but when uh, Ministry uh, offered me the job, they were toddlers, and they're a little bit harder to uh, to keep up with than uh, okay. than, than babies. So yeah, uh, I wasn't sure if I could just take six months. Because yeah. uh, it was there was no time in between. There was no like breaks. Like with Fear Factory, after each tour, let's say six weeks, um, I would be home for a period of time. Maybe sometimes only a few days or a week. Sometimes a couple of weeks. But I had to time um, to to see to my child, to see yeah. my children. Yes, this was six months, no breaks. This was you walk out the door. And you don't come home for six months, so that's hard to do with yeah. with, with young toddlers. The, the, you know, so that that was not an easy um, decision to make. But uh, this was also, you know, if you look at, you know, uh, after working with Killing Joke, Prong, and Fear Factory. Um, ministry just seemed like a logical progression. I mean, you know, mm. uh, so uh, ultimately um, it was quite a struggle. Um, uh, in fact, initially I did say no because uh, it was just, you know, a bit too much, but then they offered it to me again. I was like, you just don't turn ministry down twice. And uh, it just felt like this was the thing that I needed to do and it was going to be hard, but I was going to do it. And I did. And so, yes, it was not easy. Um, and this was a, uh, 
a lot of work I had not only to, to learn almost all of the, uh, what was the Rio Grande blood record, um, yeah. but I also had to learn, you know, all of the uh, other material. Um, uh, how, was the, how was the process? Was better than with Fear Factory? It like, was much more labor intensive and much more stressful um, because, uh, well, first of all, the working environment, we were in some old warehouse out in the desert. It smelled, uh, it was horrible. Um, it was just like unbearable. Um, yeah, Raven brought some stray dog in that was living there and it was, the place was haunted, you know, it was just like, what? Know, it, it was a really hor horrific uh, environment to work in, but we were there for four weeks um, yeah, but I uh, mean, you you have um, I don't know patches, samplers. Okay, so so prior to technical the, stuff, prior to the, prior to the actual tour rehearsals, which were four weeks, I flew out <clears throat> to uh, Texas, and uh, and uh, Al Al picked me up uh, at the airport, and um, and uh, we. Um, began working on uh, how we were going to, you know, to do this because um, uh, he and Paul Barker had parted ways and split, you know, uh, a lot of the equipment up. And so really all I had to go on were some boxes of old zip disks and floppy disks, uh, no guidance. Um, really just uh, just had to start sort of dig through these boxes and see what I could find. Um, and the reason that they really wanted me on board was because I was a master uh, on the Akai samplers. That was all I really used um, throughout my career. And it was, you know, a prerequisite for the job. They're like, you know, you're going to have to, you know, use these no, guys. Yeah. And you're going to have to figure this shit out. And, you know, once again, I'm, I'm the guy for the, for the job. That's the kind of work I do, you know? So here's the thing. And, um, and that is that by this time, you know, uh, 2006, uh, things were changing. Nobody played live samples anymore. You know, by now people were using, um, you know, task cams and ADATs and things like that, uh, to play back, uh, you know, Back in um, tracks. yes. Uh, and, but ministry was not one of those bands. So, um, uh, the Akai's were kind of by then out of production. Um, we had to get on eBay and buy as many of them as we could find. We had stacks and stacks. I'll show you pictures. We had like maybe 10 or 12 Akai S 5000s. Uh, wow. Yeah. Um, and, uh, we had, uh, you know, backup rigs, uh, um, backup samplers and, and multiple rigs that, you know, sometimes would have to ship separately to, to be able to go around the world. You know, it was very, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, 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 uh uh, labor intensive and, and costs a lot of money, you know, we shipping these giant racks of samplers. And so, yeah. um, it was kind of the, the tail end of that type of technology, but ministry was very old school. And so that's yeah. what we did. I was old school. So, yeah. So um, the only real major difference was that, yes, um, we were using clicks. Now, not click tracks because we weren't playing to tracks. It's what uh, I would call click loops um, where um, you would push down a key and it would loop the click at the particular tempo of the song. And um, uh, I was able to you know, implement um, on the, the uh, S5000 uh, a method of being able to just push the key down once and it would continue to loop the click until I hit the key again. But prior to that, with some of the earlier Akai models, couldn't do that. So what they did was they would stick a little matchbook or maybe an old floppy disk in there to wedge the key down um, no. for the for the duration of the song yeah and I, no. I i just figured that out on my own i'm like how did they do it and then i found these little match books and old floppy disks i'm like what what, what are these doing in this box i'm like oh, i know what they're doing they're using it to hold the key down to, to hold the click key down and so i had that's crazy uh, i had found some maps <laughs> i had found some some of the maps of the of the uh, other material 
Uh, but on the on the uh, on the real grand stuff, uh, it, it was all up to me to to map and program. Uh, but I did have the Pro Tools sessions and uh, an assistant engineer to help me with that. So this was uh, a lot easier than say back in the Fear Factory days where I was on my own well, getting everything. Take this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Um, Figure it out. So, yeah, so uh, so Al and I and the engineer uh, worked in his home studio, uh, archiving and collecting, um, and also subsequently, uh, you know, the Revolt and Cox were supporting ministry on this tour, so they were also having to dig through and find all of the Revolt and Cox stuff, and for that, um, uh, a gentleman named uh, Clayton Warbeck uh, was 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 on keyboards, and he was there. Uh, during some of the time that I was there and we overlapped a bit and got to, 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 to meet each other and uh, work together. In fact, I have a, a picture of him one night. He just fell asleep in the chair. He was just like nodded out in front of the sampler. And um, we both were just, like I said, uh, uh, going through this whole history of ministry and revolting Cox material and, um, and digging up what, what we could find um, to make this tour happen. And then uh, uh, I spent most of that time uh, preparing the uh, Rio Grande uh, songs. Uh, we were going to be performing most of that record. And uh, like I said, uh, at this point, I was able to kind of model my maps after some of the maps that I was finding. But I remember one thing that, that, that really cost me a lot of time and, and trouble was that um, some keyboards call middle C, C3, some call it C4. And so what, what I call C1 on some keyboard is called C0. So they had wow. used, yeah, they had used Roland controllers and um, they subsequently- on the brand? Well, they had, uh, m most of them were 76 key controllers. So there's a lot of keys, a lot of samples. And, um, and so what they were calling C1, well, what I called C1 was what the Roland calls C0. So on the Akai, I had set up my programs differently, and um, yeah. and so uh, I, it turned out I was in. Um, uh, I would have had to have either reprogrammed the entire album, the, the entire re uh, Rio Grande Blood album, or find another way. And what I did was I found a way to transpose um, the actual programs so that they would line up um the same as the old songs but it still caused quite a bit of headache because um in the actual well the akai's um are multi timbral synthesizers so um in program mode you're just playing like a single you know map but uh in in what they call the multi mode you can have um you know um, the multiple programs and so the only way i could do this transposition trick was in multi mode so whenever i jump back to program mode the keyboard was not transposed. So I'd have to use uh, another technique. I would have to transpose the actual keyboard and, and trying to keep track of all that was a real nightmare. Um, but, yeah, uh, I but, 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 but I did, but so anyway, um, I did a lot of uh, pre-production with Al and then came back out for four weeks of intensive uh, rehearsals. Um, the lineup was incredible. We had Joey Jordison on drums uh, we what? had uh, Tommy Victor on guitar. We had Mike Skasha on guitar. You're this one from Slipknot? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is the 2006 wow. uh, Rio Grande Blood Tour. Yeah. And uh, Paul Raven on bass. Um, like I said, Mike Skasha on guitar, Al Jorgensen, uh, and myself on keyboards. So it was uh, quite a lineup. I mean, uh, yeah. uh, you know, um, and so uh, the majority of the time uh was spent working on the samples um and uh so the guitar guys were just like oh my god they were like so bored they would just sit there all day <laughs> like oh i'm gonna like kill myself oh my god <laughs> when are we gonna get to play and and then it was just me and al and so this is like crazy but but al for whatever reason decided that like every single sample didn't sound right and that it had to be re eq'd and so I'm like, yeah. okay, uh, let's do it, you know? So on the Akai's, they have a built-in equalizer and you can actually resample any sample through any EQ setting. And so we got into this total rabbit hole 
where wow. e every single sample Al wanted to re-EQ it. And, and, and after a while, I started to think like, are we sure about this? Because first of all, <laughs> we're not in an acoustic environment. We're in an old yeah. abandoned, abandoned warehouse. Um, second of good. all, uh, well, second of all, uh, they had this giant Midas console, an analog console, and I swear to God, every single channel was different. And then he had a guy, he had a guy with a laptop with a spectrum analyzer running around this warehouse with a spectrum analyzer, um, looking at, 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 at what, what was coming in um, from, from all these samples. And I started to go like, wait a minute, we're like totally chasing our tails here because by the time I send a sample through that Midas, and by the time it bounces around in this warehouse uh, and gets and read onto a spectrum analyzer, who knows what's happening, right? But hey, <laughs> he's Al Jorgensen, right? So what am I going <laughs> to do? So I just kept on doing it. And here's, here's a funny story is that uh, each time you resample the, sa the sample, you, you lose any of the frequencies that were EQ'd. And the thing, you, you just start stomping on this sample until it becomes so degraded, it's almost yeah. unusable. And so it was like multiple times of doing this. So uh, what would happen is uh, he would finally say like, okay, let's do it again, let's do it again. And, and so what I would do is, um, I would just go back to the original sample and play it. And he goes, oh, God, yeah, that's it. That's, very, very, very. that's so, perfect. Uh, yeah. So, so uh, uh, once we got into actually, you know, uh, rehearsing, uh, it didn't take long for, for them to go, something's not right here because, um, like, you're not quite in time. I'm like, well, what do you mean? You know, like, I'm, I think it's pretty good. And they're like, no, nah, no, nah, it's, it's not. You know, I'm like, wow, well, shit. So it turns out, like, we're thinking by, you know, because I wasn't, using any kind of in-ear system yet. And um, I didn't actually hear these ah, clicks. The I was just, probably. yeah, well, the clicks, I was just sending the clicks to Joey and he would drum to them. And so if you think about it, by the time the click gets yeah. to him and he plays the drums and by the time I listen to the drums, it's a little delay. Yeah. yeah. So, so they were like, have you ever used in-ears? I'm like, no. I'm like, well, let's get your pair. They went down to Sam Ash and got me a, a little pair of in-ears. Um, which I used for 14 years, I, I might add. Uh, and um, and as soon as I put them in and I could hear the click, because I, you know, I have no trouble playing the clicks. Uh, uh, they were like, yes, I mean, th th you know, because because uh, they were like, uh, this isn't going to work. And I'm, as soon as I had the in-ears and was playing with Joey with the clicks, we were, we were, we were all good. So, but then it was still a lot of work. Um, uh, that, that material was insane. You know, some of the BPMs, I do believe, exceeded 200. Um, and uh, Joey, he was like a little jackrabbit, you know. But um, <laughs> uh, we also had to learn uh, all of the all the old material, you know. So um, he was the he was the drummer for the tour. Yeah, or was yeah. The, yeah, for the tour. Just for the just for the tour or for the record too. He did not drum on the record. It was mostly programmed. But I think they did have, if I remember, they might have had um, Baker. What's the, the drum? Uh, a lot of it, yeah. Um, oh, if okay. anything, if anything, some of it might have been triggered, but it was not live drums. No, I can tell. I can oh, assure okay. you that. Yeah, but um, but Joey was playing live drums, and so um, yes, uh, it was That's pretty hard. insane. Yeah, pretty insane. Um, so uh, so yeah, so just learning that Rio Grande Blood album was a lot of work, and then you know, just when you think like you know like how much more stress can, can one person <laughs> take? They're like, now you got to play the old shit, you know? And I was oh, like, fuck, oh, you know? So, yeah, so I had to, like, quickly learn, like, Just One Fix and New World Order, and, uh, and, and, and it all came to a head. This was, like, in the final, the final days, keeping in mind that uh, this tour was, was happening and uh, there was no way out. And I'm, in fact, if you had said to me, if you'd have said, look, if you'd have given me some kind of dignified way out, said, you know, here you go, JB, here's, here's your one time get out of jail free card. I might've taken it because there was that, <laughs> that much stress, you know, but I'm like, I'm, I'm in it to win it at this point. So I remember feeling that uh, I use the analogy sometimes uh, feeling like a, like a, a pilot. Uh, you know, I, I guess now uh, we can't talk about 747s much anymore. There still are some of them out there. But, you know, uh, uh, I remember thinking that um, it was kind of like piloting a 747. I felt like that kind of responsibility, like I had hundreds of, 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 of lives that I, you know, sure. un, you know, I was responsible to get this 
this tour off the ground and back down, you know, you know, each show, you know, getting it off the ground, getting it back down safely, because um, with, without me, it, it, it wasn't going to happen because, you know, they were totally dependent upon um, the samples to play along to. And, and, and for that matter, the click. Uh, so in that moment, cycles. there were no backing tracks? No backing tracks in this in this in this time. This was all done live. So this was the traditional ministry method oh, using the Akai samplers trigger live um, using um, click loops. So um, so I would push down a, a note on the keyboard. It would start a loop in our ears. Oh. Me and Joey would hear it and we would play the song to the click. But keeping in mind, it was not a track. It was not a click track. It was a loop no. on a sampler. If you if you push the key in the wrong moment. Yes. Uh, yeah, and there was a few times when like the clicks went haywire, and we were like, "What the fuck?" And I'd have to like stop it and start it again mid song, you know. Um, and then there was other times, uh, you know, when you think about it, that uh, I, you know, you have to trigger the samples at the exact right point because some of them, some of these dialogue samples were like, you know, maybe over a minute long, right? And so yeah. if you started a fraction of a second early or a fraction of a second late. It was going to drift. So, um, yeah. so yeah. So it was imperative that every sample was triggered exactly on time. And uh, and uh, and so um, yeah. That, and you never all... have electricity issues. Uh, we tried to uh, you know um, have contingency plans. We might have tried some battery backup units. You know some, mm -hmm. uh, 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 but. Um, we also had uh, redundancy in that we had two of everything. So I had two keyboards. Oh, okay. I had two racks of samplers because you couldn't do the whole show on one sampler. There wasn't enough memory. Even with all the memory maxed out, it took two samplers um, to do the show. And therefore, we needed to have two backups. So there was four samplers that was required um, for, for, for a show, but we we're also using the Akai's to trigger the drum samples. So um, one was quite sufficient for that, but we needed a backup as well. So there was six Akai's operational on stage. And of course we needed a few spares because you just never knew these things were getting uh, a little bit more temperamental, but I got to say uh, still extremely reliable and rugged. Um, yeah. uh, uh, the Akai's, um, they, they, um, uh, you know, one time in the prong days, uh, I was having problems with mine turning off and on in mid show. And of course, then it would have to reload an entire bank of samples. Um, and I even took it to the Akai factory in, in, uh, in Texas, um, and they couldn't find the problem, but I eventually found it. It was just a bad connection, um, where the uh, power supply connected to the motherboard. Um, I put a little bit of contact cleaner in there, uh, popped the socket, popped it back on and never had another problem again but uh you know that you know that was dicey but yes um it's to my understanding that um prior to my time with ministry on the on the mole tour one of the akai's caught fire <laughs> apparently <What? laughs> yeah um uh, so anyway i had uh backup units but uh, i remember my first show it was in houston it was like a like a small arena um this was a big show uh and um uh, I know that, um, you know, I was feeling the pressure. Um, you know, I had a lot of stuff in my head, you know, I had to, at this point, memorize every map of every song. So when I learned the songs, I would put a strip of tape on the keyboard. Right. And then I would kind of like make little indicators of what sample, uh, I had like a little kind of coding system, of course, mm. you know, C. CK or CLK was click and then, you know, bass loop one, bass loop two, uh, you know, kick sample, you know, a little, you know, and like, you know, vocal one, vocal two, vocal three, because a lot of the vocal effects had to be triggered via sample, the distorted vocals. Um, uh, so if people don't understand a lot of that, that, you know. Um, Can you explain that a little bit? I can what? send you, uh, in, in fact, uh, um, there's a, a really nice feature. Uh, by uh, Jim Van Curry of In the Loop magazine, uh, where he um, he uh, he um, I, I explain ah, yeah, I yeah, explain yeah. I explain how it's done and yeah. uh, and so you know um, yeah so a lot of people uh, yes it's like uh, a major trigger for uh, effect what's that it's like uh, you trigger an effect 
with that yeah key. yeah um like okay. i say the the vocal like al sings the vocal and then the delay part is actually me holding down a sample like in just one fix he goes just one fix and then i go one fix one fix one fix, 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 one fix one fix so there's a lot of that kind of stuff going on that people have no idea you know they're like what the hell is jb even doing out there you know, like, <laughs> um and so uh yes it's all very precise and it was all um mm. live and um and so, uh, so yeah, so it was a lot of pressure. Um, like I said, that first show, um, I actually, you know, really had to get into my zone. Um, I took some spare samplers and a spare keyboard to a spare room uh, where I was able to sit um, and literally, you know, kind of like go over the show. Um, uh, you know, even after sound check, I was in that room uh, going over the show and uh, just, uh, just keeping it you know, fresh in my mind and also just trying to kind of calm my nerves and just kind of, you know, just know that I needed to deliver um, and that uh, I needed to kind of, you know, give it everything that I had. And so um, we did. That show went off without um, any problems. That was an amazing show. Um, and uh, I think we still had one or two before we were able to kind of really kind of, you know, relax a little bit and go like, OK, we got this. But, yeah, it was uh, it was a lot of work. And um, I got to say, um, uh, a lot of stress um they said the guy before me i forget uh uh what they said his name was uh, i um but he, they said that he, he he had like lost 20 pounds or something you know because of all the stress that was involved what <laughs> yeah <laughs> and they had um stories uh like al said uh, on the mole tour uh where uh at least two band members uh bailed days just days prior to the tour um uh for for a variety of reasons and so he had to scramble and find a bass player or or, or guitar players at the last minute you know um so yeah, yeah that yeah. Yeah. So we we hung in there on the Rio Grande tour. Uh, like I said, the last song we we learned was So What? <clears throat> and I just remember Al trying to explain it to me. He's like, you got to feel it. You just got to feel it. It's like, the, you know, because he's like Cuban, right? He's like, it's just like he's trying to explain it. Yeah, it's born in Cuba. So, I mean, he's born there. He, he wasn't raised there. But anyway, oh, okay. uh, yeah, he, he 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 was trying to explain, you know, how that kind of like that kind of vibe of the of the rhythm and and Joey was like at this point, you know, like you know, we're both just we had these notebooks and we're just like writing everything down and and Al was like, you know, no, no, and then you know, so each time, you know, we would just kind of go with what he said and 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 uh, and uh, I remember one night Joey's like, well, wait, you you said to do it this way, and Al's like, I I wrote this song, you do it the way I tell you. <laughs> oh my god, I thought he was going to quit the band and and we were going to have no drummer, and it was like, you know, we only had like two days. Uh, before the tour started out oh, it was it was crazy it was absolutely crazy <laughs> wow that's a that's some amazing stories <laughs> uh, yeah, I, i'm full of them yeah so uh, i guess uh you so know you're, you're using the akai or now well you're... okay so you know um uh what you have to understand was when i came on board uh for the rio grand tour uh there was also going to be a subsequent uh tour for what was to be called the last sucker album which was supposed to be uh the the farewell to ministry so i only signed up for two tours they were in 06 and 08 so we figured we would just ride out uh in the sunset with the akais because uh that's the only way we had and there was you know like not a lot of other ways to go um at least not with the time and resources uh that we had True. but like many other farewell tours this turned out to not be ministry's farewell so uh in sometime in uh 2011 i got a phone call they were getting the band back together so uh i flew out to texas and this was um what was called the relapse album and um and uh and um that's when uh we had to have a very serious conversation about the akai's and the future of ministry um and they asked me they said look we're going to russia 
um, on this tour? Uh, like, are these guys going to make it? And, 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 and like I said, it, it was, uh, they were in big flight cases, you know, the, the, you know, the, uh, uh, the, 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 um, rack and rack they're called. So there's like two inches of foam inside, you know, cause so these things can, you know, can, can essentially, uh, travel, uh, safely. So they're, 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 they're large and heavy racks um, yeah. filled, filled with samplers. So subsequently it cost a, a small fortune to yeah. ship these things. And we needed, uh, multiple, uh, uh, systems. So not only did we need backups, for redundancy on stage, but we needed to have entire other systems that could travel and ship via cargo um, ahead of time. So um, it had to be coordinated. So like, okay, so this rack that you're using here is not going to be the rack you're using in Europe, you know, because that that rack already shipped, you know, and then uh, and then uh, when we come back to the US, you'll be using this system, you know, so and each one had backup systems you know in it so uh by then i mean it was like tens of thousands of dollars that they were spending yeah. on cargo and shipping and um and not to mention that these things were getting older and older um still holding up but you know how much longer can we go and and like i said when i first joined this this was already you know uh uh like outdated technology and so uh, i sometimes use the expression that i was the last of the mohicans <laughs> uh so so yeah so uh on the 2012 tour they kind of you know said to me is there any other way and i was like well nobody <laughs> nobody manufactures hardware samplers anymore the only ones that you could even get were like drum samplers and i was like that's just simply not going to work um so so yeah, so we, we hung in there with the Akai's and then um, uh, we didn't know again if ministry were to continue. Um, uh, so then this would have been um, 2013 and 14. And once again, by the end of 2014, I got a phone call from Al and he's like, we're getting the band back together. And <laughs> this was from what was called the From Beer to Eternity album. And it was going to be traveling to uh, Australia, South Africa, South America. This was a, a round the world tour. And this time uh, there was no taking the Akai's. It was like, we cannot do it. So you're going to have to think of something else. So, so um, uh, after exhausting all, you know, uh, ideas of, of a hardware based sampler, um, I had to succumb to the reality of using laptops on stage. So this involved uh, software-based samplers um, and the conventional MIDI keyboards um, and uh, using audio interfaces and once again, redundancy. So we, we bought two MacBook Pros and two RME uh, audio interfaces um, and I was um, able to use native instruments uh, contact software mm -hmm. sampler to import um, the Akai programs because uh, it had a, a really nice feature that, uh, well, and thankfully uh, the Akai um, S5000 series um, were, uh, were um, DOS formatted. Oh, okay. And used WAV file formats. Mm. for the samples so it was relatively easy um to import the, for the program for, for contact to import the akai programs because wow. otherwise i would have had yeah. to have reprogrammed the entire show um which would have been you know just an incredibly daunting <laughs> task so there was still some work to be done i had to learn contact i didn't know it yes. um, and then not everything translated uh for instance the output assignments and um and uh and and the way that it you know handled some of the parameters um was quite different so there was still uh it was still quite an operation yeah. still quite an operation and um and yes uh for that album there was so much going on a lot 
higher level of sophistication. I mean, I'm not an octopus. I don't have eight arms. So um, Al told me, you know, we're going to have to also look at, at, at perhaps um, utilizing, you know, playback uh, systems uh, for, for some of those materials. So um, for that, we use Ableton Live. And so, yeah, so I'm able to also run them simultaneously. So I've got contact and Ableton running uh, standalone uh, simultaneously um, on each laptop so that I can play samples and playback tracks at the same time. So it's pretty sophisticated. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. yeah. But can, can you, it, it's not amazing how, how you start with all the hardware, with mm -hmm. all the synthesis and even with no, mm -hmm. no, no, no MIDI. You know? Yeah, um, well, sure. When I started, uh, you know, it's like, I don't know, like you say, around 30 years. Yeah, know? well, when I went to college to study electronic music, MIDI didn't exist. It hadn't been invented. Uh, it was halfway through my college career that we, um, that we, uh, uh, it's kind had, of impressive, the, you know, technology uh, uh, yeah i mean we were using control voltage and gate interfaces um and trying to you know connect uh instruments that weren't meant to be connected you know different manufacturers had different uh standards you know um so midi uh uh was uh you know a universal uh, invention that allowed us to be able to do exactly that, to be able to connect um, devices by different manufacturers. That's what it was meant to do. And um, I remember some of my computer friends uh, immediately saying, this isn't fast enough. This isn't fast enough. This is a serial bus. It's not the baud or whatever the, you know, it's, it's not, uh, it's not that fast. It's like, you know, this, this is not acceptable. And I was like, well, fuck, I don't know much about that, but you know, uh, <laughs> We used it, you know, all through the 80s. It made a lot of amazing records. But, you know, just now they finally did uh, announce that there's going to be something called MIDI 2.0. It's going to be a, a faster, more modern uh, format uh, of MIDI, you know, some 30, 35 uh, yeah, years, no, years later. Yeah, <clears throat> but uh, it's been quite a run. And, um, and uh, you know, uh, yeah, like I said, uh, um, now... Everything is done, you know, most everything is done with plugins and software and, uh, you know, because for a long time we had to, you know, have, you know, drum machines, multi-track recorders, computers, interfaces, synthesizers, yeah. uh, effects units, um, and, and patch bays and MIDI patch everything, bays. Everything and, was separated. Yeah. yeah. And, and very uh, expensive. So. Yeah. Yeah, so expensive. Uh, now I remember when when I started programming, mm -hmm. I used to program with a Kawai, Kawai Q eighty, I think. Uh, could have been, uh, yeah. The, the sequencer, uh, yes, the sequencer. Yeah, a sequencer with a screen like this. Yeah, a little LCD. Screen. It's like it's like crazy. Yeah, you know. And then yeah. I discover Cubase. Mm -hmm. But I think was the one of the first version, and it's so it changed your life when you mm -hmm. can actually program, mm -hmm. change from this screen to <laughs> to a web screen and yeah. be able to move the note and see the note. Yeah. Because when when you program with a mm -hmm. the screen, you can actually see the see the note. You can just yeah. uh, guess. So, that. Yeah. So uh, so um, when I was finishing up my uh college uh education um we were still using um well the the, the the college didn't really have anything um that we could use uh, we all had to pool our equipment together um uh my colleague charlie clauser uh was was uh was there from yeah. Many yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. We, we went to college together um uh, and uh he was i was 18 he was 19 when we when we first met and uh we were working in the electronic music program uh he bought the one of the very first uh insonic mirages which was a really big deal um and uh uh um i bought uh, a memory moog um uh refurbished wow. uh, from a company up in new york that was uh selling them and uh we kind of combined forces and uh 
And, uh, and so, yeah, um, one of our friends had a Commodore 64 with the very first MIDI interface, a sequential circuits um, MIDI interface. And we were, um, we were doing uh, computer based sequencing in college. But uh, let me tell you this, um, the Apple Macintosh hadn't been invented yet. <laughs> wow. <laughs> there was pre Mac. So uh, my final year, uh, the Macintosh came out, but this was like for word processing. Uh, they had them over at the library. Sure. Nobody, there was no music software or interfaces. It wasn't until we had graduated and consequently, uh, Charlie, um, got me a job at Sam Ash music where he was working, um, in, in Manhattan. And we both worked there together and he had, uh, purchased a Mac and was using it and then he wanted to upgrade so i bought his mac uh uh that had all the software in it and the interface um uh, and so my first computer was charlie clauser's uh um uh, uh 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 apple mac plus um uh wow. and uh he bought uh, a turbo like like a turbocharged one that had like uh maybe i mean that time i I correct me if I'm wrong, but there was already a MIDI interface integrated, or or not? Yeah, yeah, they had um, uh, a company called Opcode uh, was making MIDI interfaces for the Mac, and they also had their own sequencer called 2.5, which was uh, an amazing program, but it it, it wasn't quite ready yet. It, uh, okay. When you when you, it was a pattern based sequencer, which was amazing, um, but um, when you try to string patterns together, there was like a little lag <laughs> no. when it went from one pattern to the next. So it was almost like useless, but they quickly, well, actually not quickly, uh, before they could get that the kinks out, um, a, a, a company that had been around already called Passport had uh, a, a pattern-based sequencer called uh, Master Tracks Pro. And that was the one that I really first used. And... Um, It was graphics based and and pattern based and uh, an amazing program. Um, but uh, uh, Opcode finally got the kinks out and released um, what was called uh, Vision. And it took kind of what Passport was doing and and also what what Sequencer 2.5 was doing and um, and put it all together in a very uh, Um, comprehensive program, uh, like I said, called Vision, and that's what um, what really I started working on. And then um, there was a little program called Sound Tools, that was a two-track editing program, quite clever uh, that you could use to kind of you know do editing and things. But uh, it quickly um, expanded to, to, to more than two track. I think it four tracks and then on, onward up and um and so then was uh, eventually uh called pro tools so wow. uh opcode had to up their game um to compete with pro tools and they um came out with what's called studio vision which also offered uh digital audio and playback multi-channel digital audio and playback and this by by this time we're talking about going into the the, the mid 90s it was still pretty Uh, cutting edge technology, a bit pricey on um, the interfaces and things. But uh, I remember buying the last Audio Media 2 card <laughs> uh, and putting it in um, a refurbed uh, Apple Mac Quadra 950. This was like around 95, 96. And, you know, like you said, this stuff's expensive. Um, I didn't have a lot of money to throw around, but um, but you have to kind of you know, keep up. So, uh, I, I got, I got a system that I was running from the mid nineties into the late nineties, uh, running studio vision. And then, uh, opcode, uh, abruptly went out of business. Um, and, uh, it was like, you know, what am I going to do? So, um, uh, one of the things about the Apple Macintosh is that, um, They're expensive, you know, um, much more expensive yeah. than than PCs. And and for people in Europe, they were literally un, unaffordable because the apples had to be uh, exported. They're made in the U.S. or well, I mean, apples, uh, U.S. company, whatever. Uh, for whatever reason, um, to buy in in those days, in the mid uh, to late '80s, to buy um, 
an Apple Macintosh, if you lived in, in Europe, uh, would have been like $10,000 or something like yeah. that. And some of the newer Macs, the Mac 2s, were also in, in that price range of upwards of $10,000. So, and, and these Akai samplers, uh, the 16-bit the, the, the ones, um, they were also, to get them pretty much maxed out, were in the five to $10,000 price range. So, yeah, th uh, they, 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 quite, quite, quite an expensive yeah. uh, undertaking. But uh, for, for, um, for folks that, you know, couldn't, couldn't afford um, the apples, uh, they were buying the Atari STs. And the clever thing about them was they had MIDI built in. Uh, yeah. You, you didn't need a MIDI interface. Yeah, and, I remember. Um, they had some very clever programs and you mentioned Cubase. And um, uh, one of the programs that, uh, that came out on the Atari uh, uh, um, was from a uh, German company called C-Lab. Um, and uh, I think it was called Creator or something like that. But they, uh, they also came out with what was called Notator, which was um, uh, a really amazing program that did sequencing and also could could do musical notation and print it. Um, so wow. it was uh, suddenly like we were always like the us Mac guys were like, oh, the Atari, that's like a toy. That's just for like kids <laughs> play. And suddenly this this program called Notator came out and we were just like scratching our heads like, what the fuck? Like, why don't <laughs> we have this for the Mac? And there was rumors and there was talk about it coming to the Mac platform, mm -hmm. but it was quite some time, but eventually it did. And uh, it was called Logic. And um, so Logic was mm -hmm. born from yeah. Notator and a company called C-Lab. But uh, ultimately um, Apple, uh, scooped up a lot of the programmers from Opcode who were some of the early developers of OS X. Okay. Because Opcode had its own proprietary MIDI system called OMS, Opcode MIDI system. It was a total fucking nightmare. Um, I don't even know what they were thinking, but uh, I guess they were thinking that, you know, they needed something, you know, more comprehensive and, 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 uh, uh, you know, to to uh, to handle um, more complicated MIDI, uh, you know, systems and and things. And so, with uh, with the demise of Opcode, yeah, um, uh, came the birth of OS X, which was supposed to be a more music friendly operating system. Mm. You know, uh, this is my understanding. As a funny story, is the, the whole reason that. Apple has been so difficult, you know, as much as they have all these amazing programs, um, it's been really complicated to make music happen with Apple's because they don't have any direct MIDI interface, you know? Um, and the reason, mm -hmm. it's my understanding that the whole reason behind that was the name Apple. Um, there was a lawsuit with uh, the Beatles recording company, Apple Music, um, oh, yeah. And uh, it was ultimately settled, uh, like maybe around 1992 or something, uh, where um, Apple, you know, part of the settlement was that Apple was not allowed to kind of market the, uh, the, the music application of their computer. It's all supposed to be ultimately left up to third party. Um, and so that's why, say, like the Atari ST was able to have a MIDI interface built in. Yeah. Apple could never do something like that because it would, mm. it would violate that, that that agreement of that settlement. So that's my understanding. Uh, I think there is some truth to that, but you know, somebody might be able to tell me, tell me differently. But um, uh, so nonetheless, um, OSX was supposedly, you know, much later, it was kind of like, okay, you know, you know, somehow we're going to have to get around this. But, uh, but so, uh, I, um, ultimately, uh, settled on logic because the only other contenders was like performer, uh, program. There's a linear based program that, well, then logic ultimately is too, but, uh, for, for whatever reason, I, I never got into performer. There was a digital performer that they got more graphics based, but I just never got into to mark of the unicorn stuff. And so, um, so yeah, so I switched over to logic and, um, and, uh, uh, Apple uh, ultimately eventually uh, bought C Lab and uh, they own um, Logic now. So, uh, yeah. You know, uh, yeah, and uh, now with Lo Logic Pro, um, uh, 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 um, they've, you know, they're like, you know, basically the direct competitor to, to say Pro Tools. And for me, uh, you know, I looked at getting into Pro Tools, obviously. 
it's like the industry standard, but I'll tell you, um, and you probably know this, it's not to get into pro tools to really get into pro tools. You've got to spend a lot of money and, and it's yeah. not, it's not even like a one shot deal. Um, you got to keep spending. Yeah. And, you um, have to yeah, and, it every year. Every yeah. Year. Uh, I, you know, I priced it out. I was like, I, you know, to really get in, you know, to, to what I wanted was like, Forty to fifty thousand dollars because there's a lot yeah. of hardware, and I wanted the control surface. I wanted everything, and uh, and I was like, you know, even if I do, even if I were to spend fifty thousand dollars in a couple of years, I would be like probably yeah. looking at a lot of obsolete equipment and hardware, and probably be yeah. looking at also um, putting a whole lot more money into it. So I was like, yeah, that's not, you know, uh, I'm not making that kind of money to, to justify that kind of expense. So yeah, sure. for a fraction of the price, I uh, overhauled my studio with a, with a nice control surface, Logic Pro, you know, um, you know, um, uh, Mac Pro. Uh, and, um, yeah. and, uh, and I'm, I'm happy, 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 happy. Yeah. And can you, well, you, you talk a, a lot about your path. You, you can tell us a little, before be, because we already <laughs> talked two hours yeah i know <laughs> i don't know if you 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 feel tired or not uh, well that... well I'll wrap, I'll, i can kind of you know i think we can kind of move into what what i'm doing now but i'll just wrap up you know i know that we you know really wanted to cover false icons that was um something you know so i wanted to kind of you know you know kind of finish up the false icon story yeah. um which was you know, this was my my opportunity to kind of show what I could do and to do what I felt that I wanted to do and needed to do um, because I had it in me and, you know, had been spending my whole life, uh, you know, kind of, yeah, of you know, build, building up. So, yeah. So False Icons has continued um, and uh, and uh, it's had to, you know, obviously ministry is my first priority, um, but there was a lot of time that ministry was not touring. So I was able to get false icons and meet you and work with vigilante and um and uh we did some we did some uh some collaborating with the, the new resistance and the video mm -hmm. and, and we did some shows together um and then uh also um ascension of the watchers uh has um uh a new album coming out um uh and uh False Icons is working on new material and, and performing again. Um, but now, of course, with the pandemic, everything is kind of like, you know, live yeah. performing uh, has come to a halt. So we're back in the studio and um, uh, there's new False Icons coming. But uh, oh. but the, the, um, the, the, the latest news is that I'm producing um, uh, and uh, uh, one of the bands I'm producing is called Chemical Straight Jacket. And uh, they got signed to Cleopatra Records, and now um, uh, I'm That's also great. producing a, a second record for them, which is almost done. And um, uh, a new band um, that um, lives near me called Malice Machine, um, industrial dance music, which is incredible. And uh, I'm producing their new album, and uh, uh, I'm collaborating with a, a uh, a group called Nukes, um, which features uh, Chris Connolly, Anne Ash, uh, Jim Marcus, David J from Bauhaus, uh, myself, um, uh, a whole army of exciting, creative people. Um, yes, that's awesome. uh, yeah, so that uh, we just released our first um, single, Death Sky, that I produced and mixed and and uh and then um the other really really big news is that um i'm releasing a solo album yes john, Bech john bechtel so uh i just uh, put my first single up uh, uh recently for people to hear and got an amazing you know response positive response and, yeah i listened to it on, yeah. on soundcloud and mm -hmm. it's pretty yeah. good yeah, thank you. So um, I actually have a whole album worth of material, solo material, which um, I'm going to be uh, releasing very soon. So there's a lot, a lot going on. No, oh, that's great. No, John, I really thank you mm -hmm. for sharing all these amazing stories. Uh, You're welcome, my friend. Your experience. And well, I, I hope to uh, see you soon. And I invite yes. everyone to check out your your upcoming new album, all your Excellent. projects, and you. well, see you soon. Yes, my friend. I Take hope. Care. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Bye.